Ce qui se passe dans les bois est un véritable podcast sur la criminalité. Nous discutons d'événements qui sont souvent de nature violente. La discrétion de l'auditeur est conseillée. What happens in the woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. Well, hello, friends, and welcome back to the campfire. We are back with our second episode for this season. Hi, Bryce. Hello. <laughs> I don't know why that makes you laugh. I always say hello. Yeah, but I never know when to expect it. That's the thing. I gotta keep you guessing. I sure. mean, can't can't be predictable. Yeah. No. Well. We do have kind of a special announcement, a little special announcement. So we are coming up on our 100th episode, and we decided that we needed to do something pretty fucking spectacular, something we've never done before, something that I'm not sure still, but I'm all in. Yeah. Yeah. So for our 100th episode, we are going to do what everybody loves, everybody's favorite, especially Bryce's. What? We're doing a special WTF episode, but with but, a twist. Go on. <laughs> do tell. So uh, we're going to assemble the gang and we're going to give you a live episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So September 1st, which is a Friday, we will join, I don't know, join hands in what the fuckery. And we're going to bring you a very special mm-hmm. WTF live 6 p.m. Pacific time. So 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. And... You know, it it could be the most wonderful thing we've ever done, or it could be, well, it could just be wonderful. Yeah. The fuckery will be real. Let the chaos ensue. Yeah. It's unscripted. Yep. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Mm-mm. But, yeah, we want to celebrate our 100th episode. Yeah. You know. And we want to do it in a way that others can participate. Yeah. Yeah, we we want you guys to be with us live, enjoy us as these things just flow out of our mouths to discuss. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you guys can interact, ask questions, um, you know, give us your opinions on these what the fucks that we find to discuss. The fun facts will be there. So we've got all the OGs. Everybody's participating. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good times. So there's going to be some more details to follow. We're thinking Instagram right now. We're just thinking that's the easiest platform for everybody to be able to navigate and join us. So we want to make it easy for you guys to join. And there's going to be an even more special announcement during Mm -hmm. that live. Yeah. 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 Can't hardly wait. No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) We're excited. We're excited about it. I hope that, you know, a lot of people can can join us for it. So we're giving you plenty of time. If you can't RSVP, you know, over a month from now, uh, what are you doing with your life? Like we're giving you so much time to rearrange schedules. The puppies will be here, I'm sure. Well, the podcast puppies. That's really going to be chaotic. I don't think everybody knows. Like they, they are hanging out right now, and they know when we record, they just lay here. Yeah, they just come and hang out, and you know, at some point, somebody will make a noise. But of course, yeah. But no, they love it. They love to come in here and just sit with us while we're chit chatting, doing whatever. They're always with us. 
Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully that is something that everybody's looking forward to. We are, and we hope that everybody's excited to to join with us. So September 1st, 100th episode. All right. Any other announcements? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we did a thing in March. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we did an interview for yeah. Crime Door TV in March. And uh, I, I don't know. We just, I don't know how we missed it. They said it would be at the end of March that it would they be released. They said mid-April. and I. Oh, oh, yeah, I guess it was. I. It was dead smack April. And yeah. I don't, we... We were looking somewhere else. We were looking on 2B TV and yeah. it came out on the Roku channel. Yeah, I think that's where the live, like the current and live shows are coming. But yeah. I, I was looking um, at 2B or um, what's the other one? I don't know. Um, well, it, it goes to, um, I, I want to say Discord. It goes to Plex. Oh, also, yeah. and so I kept checking Plex, and it wasn't on e- any one of those. They like, yeah. So I was also looking for a specific episode number, mm-hmm. and it ended up not being that episode number. No, oh, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, and then life. The further you get away from things, the more you, your space for remembering things is limited. So I. I don't know. It was really a big deal when we did it. And I, I, I don't know. You, you kind of have this feeling of I'm really not that important. So it's not like I think about these things that much yeah. like, Oh, we were interviewed and we <laughs> we're just so big deal. Now it, it wasn't like that. It was, it was a great experience. It was a unique thing to do. And it was, you know, it, it sounds cliche. It was an honor to be able yeah. to, to take part in something like that. So. Yeah. And I mean, that whole team was easy to work with, especially Sydney. The surprising thing is she knew how to pronounce Piala. Yeah. Yeah. She, she so. didn't even stutter. Nope. She was awesome. Yeah. So it, it was really a great thing to have happen for our, our little podcast. Yeah. Tiny, tiny podcast. Yeah. It was it was a big deal. And we will link the episode so that everybody can check it out. But please, you know, they've done well over a hundred episodes of, of this now. They do a really good job about discussing cases that are yeah. not I mean, yeah, they're they're in the forefront, but there are a lot of things that they discuss and a lot of people that they have on for mm. discussion and panel that are not getting mainstream media attention. And it is, I think now more than ever, that is vital to keeping certain cases and certain, you know, just certain ways of looking at things and and changes and discoveries and things. It's important to not have everything that is being portrayed in the mainstream media get attention. Yeah. There needs to be attention brought to some of these things and they are definitely doing that and they're yeah. doing it well. Yeah. And and so I'm happy to support them in any way we can too. So please, you know, keep checking them out. Don't just go and watch our episode, but really, you know, check them out and you will get introduced to other things from from that. So yeah, it was really cool. It was fun. Yeah, it was nerve wracking. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Green River Killer. And for more on this case, we've got Jess and Bryce with us today, the co-host couple of the podcast. Yay! What in the Woods. Thank you both so much That's for joining nice. us today. Thank you for having us. Um, yeah, and let's talk more about this case. So I know no, it was, it was, it was a really good episode, podcast. and like Why I said, that, that team made us feel at home and not not weirded out, but. Yeah. Definitely go check it out. It's on the Roku channel, Crime Door TV, and then we're episode 97. Uh, like Jess said, we'll link it. Yeah. We'll link it on Instagram. We'll link it on our website. Yeah. Yeah. We're kind of a big deal. I mean, just slightly. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. No. You know, I'm kind of disappointed this year as much as we 
talked about it and it was so important last year, there there isn't another true crime fest this year. Yeah. They or, didn't even plan one. Or we're just not invited back. No, there is nothing. I've looked I'm at the website. Kidding. We weren't that bad. <laughs> Whatever. We, got we put weren't in the that corner. bad. We yeah. That's all right. We we had fun in the corner. It was a party corner. Yeah. It was fine. I'm kind of I'm disappointed. I didn't think I would be disappointed <laughs> if we didn't do that again. But I kind of am. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it would be, you know, for any of our, our listeners that listen in Seattle, if you guys are interested in local shows like that, I know we're not the only podcast that will do live shows. No. You know, there's other... I, I think it would be really cool to, to carry that on in some way. I don't know. I think it would. I I think there could be a, a desire yeah. in the community for something like that. I would be interested to be a part of something like that again. Okay. Yeah. I I didn't think I I didn't think I'd feel that way. Yeah. Uh, after all the anxiety I had last year, but yeah. It's, it's kind of sad, actually. All right. Any other? No. All right. Well, are you ready to hear this case? Let's do it. All right. Um, this is, again, another first for us. Oh. Yeah. Today we're diving into a case of a mass shooting at a Washington University campus. All right. Let me take you back to the afternoon of June 5th. 2014 in Seattle, Washington. So multiple calls uh, started coming into 911 that there was at least one male active shooter on the Seattle Pacific University campus. The calls were coming from students and staff in the um, Otto Miller building on the campus. And when police arrive at the scene, they find that the armed man has already been subdued by a student. Mm -hmm. Um, The student happened to be a volunteer security member and there was other staff at that point that came in to to help. When the shooter's shotgun had misfired, causing the shooter to be distracted, the volunteer student pepper sprayed him oh. and was able to disarm him, get him into chokehold, and you know, police soon arrived afterwards. The aftermath was devastating. One student was killed, several seriously injured. And the campus was just turned upside down. So let's talk about the shooter a little bit. 26-year-old Aaron Ibarra was a young man with a long history of mental health issues, drug and alcohol abuse, and thoughts of violence. Aaron is a middle child, having an older sister and a younger brother. And he has, you know, his family life is just not pleasant. Um, He began having a strong affliction of OCD at the age of 13, and he didn't understand why he felt so out of control. He had issues with school. He was not really able to make much of his studies at either public or home schools that he attended. Mm -hmm. He seemed to always be looking to fit in, and he seemed to have a good amount of friends that he would regularly hang out with. His circle of friends had a variety of things to say about him. Some claimed that he would help anyone in any way that he could, um, that he was always trying to make people laugh, that he you know, had a great sense of humor, that he was just a really kind person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the old saying, he would give you the shirt off of his back if you needed it. Mm-hmm. There were a few who were not surprised at how his life turned out, saying that he was just kind of out of control especially with the drug addiction, alcohol addiction. And he was filled with violent thoughts and he expressed them on multiple occasions. Very much a contradiction between the two. You know, some people saying he was just this great, fun-loving guy and other people saying that they were seriously concerned because he had a lot of issues. Yeah. I will say this right now. If my friends go on TV and say he was such a nice guy, fuck you. Every, everybody would know that's not true. I think that's just what you say about people. I, I don't know. Oh. You know, it's the old, oh, they lit up a room wherever they went. I didn't light up a fucking room. 
No, you don't. No. No, neither one of us really light up a room. No. <laughs> no. Don't say that shit. <laughs> no. No. Hey. Nobody's fucking lighting up this room, goddammit. That's right. <laughs> Aaron, his brother, and his father all had some issues with dependencies on drugs and alcohol. Aaron's grandfather, um, his name was Ambrosia Ybarra, was a veteran of the Korean War, and he would later go on to become the first Hispanic mayor in Washington. Oh. Yeah. There were a lot of expectations that were placed on the family due to his political career. Mm-hmm. And um, Aaron's father, Ambrose Ibarra, was the complete opposite of his father. He suffered from alcohol abuse. He had depression issues that would trouble um, Aaron as well. In 2013, just one year prior to the shooting, Ambrose would be found by Aaron having tried to slit his throat in an attempt to commit suicide. And that, no matter what else is going on with this poor guy, and, and yeah, I say poor guy because mental health issues are, are very real, especially when you are feeling out of control. I don't sympathize with what he did, but I can have empathy for having the mental health issues. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you feel when you've come across your parent who's trying to harm themselves in that way? Yeah. And, and knowing that you're suffering from, you know, you're on a similar path. Mm-hmm. And and he recognized that he recognized that he was on a similar path with his his brother and his father. That really, you know, when you don't have the support to deal with what you're going through and 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 traumatic events like that, it's it, it it's not helpful. No. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not going to just bounce off of that and no. just bounce back to whatever baseline normal would be for you. you there's there's things that happen after that, you know. There are several police reports of like domestic disturbances involving family members or Aaron. In 2010, Aaron called 911 claiming that he had thoughts of committing suicide and hurting others. In 2012, there was a report of finding Aaron intoxicated after driving up on a sidewalk in Edmonds, Washington. His blood alcohol level was 0.18, which I believe is like double uh, the legal limit. A little bit more than that. Yeah. In October of the same year, he was found in the middle of the street in Mount Lake Terrace. Again, he was drunk and he was claiming, quote, he wanted a SWAT team to come get him and make him famous. Okay. Yeah. There were two attempts to have him involuntarily committed, but there are a lot of reports that give some conflicting information. Um, either he refused to go inpatient hmm. or one of his family members would claim that he did not need to. So he was not held. After the incident in 2012, he was again referred for mental health help. But again, he never stayed for inpatient treatment. He claims that his family ignored signs even after he had the DUI from the event in early 2012. And he... Apparently, they told him to seek therapy, which his parents helped him pay for at first. But he kept drinking while he was seeing the therapist. So they told him he would need to start paying for it on his own. Mm. It just sucks because if they knew he had an alcohol problem, they got to deal with that first. Right. Get him clean. Right. It's just a, it's a shitty situation. It, it is because, you know, it. it it's one thing for you to know that you need to go through and get clean, go through a program, try to get clean. It's another thing when you know that you've got family members who are doing the same exact thing mm-hmm. and they're not seeking help. No. So are you going to be supported? Are you really going to be supported? You know? Mm. Yeah. It It is. It's just a shitty situation where your parents are like, we'll help you if you need to talk to someone but oh, you're drinking. Oh, never mind. We're not going to pay for you. Yeah. I mean, these are his words. If, no, if that's yeah. really what happened. No, I'm, and I was going to say, you know, frustrated parents, you know, and I feel for them. But we, yeah, we don't know the whole situation. I, I, I mean, therein lies the truth somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, the, the parents, obviously there were some issues there. Yeah. They were not equipped to... I would feel, in my opinion, 
if you cannot handle your own issues as parents, you cannot handle your child's issues. No. You, especially given that there's the mental health aspect that they, I mean, I kind of will go on to that next to talk about, they're not helping him handle that mm -hmm. at all. And there are multiple family members who have these same issues yeah. Nobody is is seeking treatment and nobody it seems that nobody really is trying to seek treatment. Or, or is it that that it's so normal for them that it's that they don't think it's wrong? I, I kind of think so. I I kind yeah. of feel that way. But I also, you know, the the reports, the like official reports, like police reports, hospital reports are stating that they are trying, you know, health workers are trying to get him to do inpatient stays and mm -hmm. he either he is not willing to do it or, or a family member, there's an article that mentions his mom said he didn't need to do it. So, but then why would you turn around and have the expectancy that he needs to go through to therapy In inpatient stay is the best way to jumpstart therapy? Yeah. Yes, it sucks because you are... You are stripped bare. You don't have privileges. You are, you know, it's almost like being detained. You you don't really have privileges. You are expected to participate in a program where you're going to be very uncomfortable, especially if you have a chemical dependency. You're not going to be, you, they're going to be trying to help you get off of your chemical dependency while they're expecting you to go through therapy and deal with your issues. Uh, yeah. It's very fast, it's very uncomfortable, and it's very overwhelming, but it is the quickest way for people to access immediate mental health care sometimes. So, you know, if that's what you want him to do, and you're going so far as willing to pay for it, why would you, why would you turn down the, the, the you know, committing to a program? It, it, it kind of contradicts, I feel. No, it does. Yeah. But I do get where people want to do things on their own terms. You know, they maybe they're okay with doing therapy. Maybe that's not their first choice to go to therapy. But they're, they will not do, you know, inpatient stay. They, they just won't do it because it, it takes too much control from them. And they're not ready to do that. Yeah. I, I can see that. I can see that that point of, of not wanting to give up what little control you probably feel like you have. And it's it is scary because everybody has this idea of what impatient stay looks like. And it's it's not happy. Yeah. You know, it's not a happy thing. So I just think there was a lot there. Family history, family problems, there's a lot to to try to navigate yeah. and you know, your willingness to, to help get help with the system is when it's offered is key to, to stopping that vicious cycle kind of. Yeah. Yeah. At age 23, Aaron started having bad, what he called bad feelings. And it manifested as like hatred towards just toward everybody. The, the entire world was just, he, he had this immense, Hatred. Feelings of violence towards everybody. Oh. It kind of kicked off with his parents getting rid of um, his familiar bedroom furniture against his wishes. And this is something that he thinks is like part of the OCD where he needed familiar things. Mm -hmm. And they apparently replaced his bedroom furniture against what he asked them to do. And he felt that it was just kind of the beginning of him losing control and giving in to these dark thoughts that he had. During this time, he was, you know, he was seeing a, the psychotherapist and they were able to get some medication started for mental health concerns. So mm -hmm. he began taking Prozac and Risperdal. After being diagnosed with transient psychosis and officially diagnosed with OCD. So he's 23 years old. That means he thinks that he's been dealing with OCD since he was 13, 10 years, and it, it only progressively gets worse. Aaron began to start idealizing violence. He 
kind of honed in on the Columbine shooters, Mm -hmm. what they did. He identified with the masterminds of the shooting, especially Eric Harris. He repeatedly in the police interview that I will kind of discuss later on, repeatedly mentions Eric Harris and the Virginia Tech shooter. It it's 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 hyper focus for him and the things that they thought their ideology, why their reasons were for doing what they did, he identified with them and he fixated on them. He stated that even if he wanted help to change this at this point, he could not stop what he was doing. He claimed that there was a price to pay. And if his routine was interrupted or something was taken from him, that there was a price to pay. He had to make it right by hurting somebody. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, well, a little weird. Well, I, I think there's a lot more to OCD than people think there is. And I, I do think that that checks and balances are, are part of that. Uh, yeah. And so I do see where that would be a thought process for him. You know, you've done this to me. I need to make it right somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's very much the, you know, what you do to me, I'm going to return to you, you know, tit for tat. I think that's really a, a big part of OCD that people don't think about, especially in people who have very severe OCD. He also mentioned that he felt that quote, God had betrayed him. Mm -hmm. He says that I prayed to him, but that he didn't help me. So up until the age of 23, he, you know, had Christian uh, background, like the family had Christian values and he tried to live that way and that he hit that age and he no longer wanted to live that way. He felt abandoned by God. He felt abandoned by Christianity and he began to look into like Satanism, other things as he was turning more violent and having these violent thoughts. Aaron stopped taking his medication for about six months, like prior six months prior to this, the incident of the shooting. Mm -hmm. He didn't think the medications were working. I was going to say, why did it say why he stopped? He didn't feel like they were working and he, he just, he didn't want to feel the way he was feeling any longer. He, he didn't like the way that he was feeling and he didn't think the medication was working. He didn't think the therapy was working mm-hmm. and, and he gave up on it really. And, and if you're not supportive, that's very easy to do. In the days leading up to the shooting, he planned and made preparations on which weapons he was going to use, which university campus he would carry out his plan on. And ultimately, just due to the location of where Seattle Pacific University was, it was close to his house, that's what he chose. Two weeks prior to the shooting, Aaron was given a private tour of the campus. He says by, quote unquote, manipulating two girls that he came across while walking around. I think that's maybe trying to make yourself sound a little more Mm. (laughs) self-important. Then you are, if you walk around a campus and you're looking a little lost and you start asking people, you know, Hey, I'm trying to transfer here. You know, you start talking to people. It's not manipulation. Yes. It's a lie. That's not what your intent is. But the way he was saying it was like, Oh, you know, I, I conned these women. I conned these people into going along with me and they, you know, they had no idea of what my plan was. And it's this huge manipulation, like he's this mastermind. And I think that's him trying to put himself in the shoes of the people that he's, you know, idling. Yeah. You know, it's, it's him trying to put himself on their level. Yeah. And it really, what it was, was just, him getting a campus tour, like they'll give anybody who says that they want to transfer to that campus. Yeah. You're going to get a campus tour. People are going to be helpful. He gave a story that he was just this transfer student from a local community college and that he was scoping out, you know, and it's the end of the, the year, you know, people are getting ready for their finals and, and things like that. So it's not unheard of 
that there are going to be people on campus who are interested to transfer for the next coming semester. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's not masterminding, manipulating. It, it's just a story. He uh, decided that he was going to plan his attack for the week when like finals would be carried out because that's still when a lot of people would be there. And that was the opportune time that he had before yeah. the end of the season, you know, the end of the semester. Well, he knew that everybody would be there because everybody has to take the test. It would right. be the busiest time. Yep. So he scoped out the Otto Miller building and, you know, kind of looked around the first floor. He didn't go upstairs, but he looked around the first floor, made sure he knew where exits were, you know, where would he park? What would he try to do? You know, what, where, how could he exit if he was going to exit? That kind of thing. So complete strategy, game planning, what he was going to do. And when we come back from a short break, we'll discuss the series of events that day. On the day of the shooting, Aaron spent it much like any other. He woke up, ate breakfast, kind of got ready for the day, had a phone call with his brother. He claimed to have discussed nothing important, and his brother had no idea at all what was planned. He packed what he thought he would need to carry out the plan. He disassembled a shotgun and put it in a garbage bag, then placed that in a backpack. The shotgun, along with three boxes of rounds and a hunting knife, were all together in the backpack. Aaron left home around 2.15 p.m. He arrived at the SPU campus in his Chevy truck around 3. He parked on the street and he began to reassemble his 32-inch barrel shotgun in his truck. He exited the truck with the shotgun, the hunting knife, and only two boxes of the ammo because that's all he could carry. Um, so that was about 50 rounds. And he said he really planned on doing a lot of damage that day. When he began walking to the Otto Miller building, he quickly came across a few people just standing outside. Um, he approached a 19-year-old by the name of Paul Lee and showed him his gun. And when Lee, as Aaron claims, when Lee didn't seem scared by the weapon, mm -hmm. Aaron decided to shoot him because he was being disrespected. So... Lee was shot in the back of the head at close range. Pellets from the shotgun also hit a person who was standing not long or not far away. Um, his name was Thomas Fowler. And at this point, Aaron's shotgun misfired. So one of the shells did not eject. Um, so he only had one working barrel of the shotgun. He tried to shoot at a female who was with Thomas, mm -hmm. but he could not get it to fire. And so she was able to run away. So was Thomas. Unfortunately, Paul does not survive. He is the, the one victim who was killed in this incident. Aaron managed to reload the one barrel and he con uh, continued inside the Otto Miller Hall where he found a few people sitting at tables and they were just reading, you know, studying. And the first person that he came up to is Tristan Cooper Roth. He was seated at a table. He had earbuds in. And in surveillance video, it appears that no one really is just taking notice of Aaron as he comes in, even though he's carrying this fucking shotgun. Mm -hmm. Nobody is, like, everybody's just kind of, you know, nose down not really observant of anything else other than what they're doing. So he seems to be trying to get the attention of two males who are seated at different tables. Yeah. They don't acknowledge him in the video. It is from what it looks like. They don't acknowledge him in his interview with the police. He states that he had, he tells Tristan that he just shot somebody outside the building and he claims, quote, I don't want to hurt you. And he claims that he got an acknowledgement. But the video, I would say, does not reflect that. His attention was then caught by a student who was coming down the staircase from the second floor. So he saw um, student Sarah Williams. He claims that he tells her, I have a gun. I'm going to shoot. I don't want to hurt you. Don't make me, basically. Which, again, I think is is 
contradictory. Yeah. You obviously have no qualms about shooting anybody. You came there with the intention to hurt everybody. Yes. 50 rounds in your pocket don't lie. So you, you're claiming that you just shot somebody outside the building. Mm -hmm. Why are you telling, why are you claiming to tell people I don't want to hurt you? What is the point in that? I I feel like it's very conflicting. Mm. So apparently in his statement, Sarah, who was coming down the stairs, kind of laughed, laughed it off. Yeah. I don't know that anybody holding a shotgun that you can see, you're going to be laughing it off when they say, I've got a gun. Like, Mm -hmm. obviously you've got a gun. But again, he feels like he's being disrespected and nobody is taking him seriously. These are his words. These are his words. The, the, like I said, the surveillance video, ha, the, the, I didn't hear it with sound. So I cannot hear if he's talking. I can't hear if anybody's responding to him. What you see, though, doesn't really mirror what he gives in a statement. Are they able to to hear it in court? Maybe. I I don't know because it was actually, I'll get to it in a little bit. It was released on the news, on news media. So they did not play any sound. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it was played in court with sound. Okay. Yeah. So he, again, he feels he's being disrespected. He's not being taken seriously. So he shoots at the female. He's in a position where he had wide open view of, of everything. So he does hit her in the upper chest area, but she is not injured to where she falls. She is, she's stunned Mm -hmm. and obviously injured, but she is able to get away because after that he has to reload and he's still only working with one barrel. Okay. So Tristan Cooper Roth also gets away. The other student who was in at a table also gets away at this time as he's trying to deal with his shotgun. So as he's trying to reload, a student who was volunteer security guard that evening named John Meese comes up from behind and tackles him. He gets him to the ground. The shotgun is kicked away. Ibarra begins fumbling for something in his waistband, which you can see eventually is the large knife. Mm-hmm. Because at this point, per his words, he is thinking, I, I this is going to have to end. So he's going to take out whoever he can take out. And then he's going to end his own life is is what the plan is now. So Meese also kicks away the knife. He gets it away from him and he he holds him down. He gets him in a chokehold. So Ivara is essentially out. He's he's done. There's no other weapons for him. And he is not able to fight back, essentially. So who who was the guy that tackled him? John Meese. Oh, Meese. Mm -hmm. It's M-E-I-S. Oh, I thought you said John Reese. No, Meese. Like Terminator? (laughs) No. It's Terminator. No. No, the guy that came back. Oh, no. Never mind. I don't think that was his name. Anyway. No, it Kyle wasn't Reese. Kyle Reese. Yeah, that was it. I was gonna say, I, I, I you know, I hate John the Terminator. John Connor movies. was who John was Connor. Saying. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. We got it. Okay, we're we're good now. We're good. Okay, it has nothing to do with this, but I'm I'm glad we uh, could well, throw in yeah. a Terminator yeah. reference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, how often do you get to do that? It's Challenge. happened a few times. Challenge accepted. I know. Yeah. At about 324 is when the 911 dispatchers began receiving phone calls about a shooter, active shooter on the SBU campus. And one of which is actually Tristan Cooper Roth, who is, you know, one of the the people who was able to run away mm-hmm. and, and did not get sure. get hit. Yeah. And it's really quick, the response time. So 329 is when Seattle PD started arriving at the at the campus and actually in Otto Miller Hall. And they are quick to come in. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he is subdued. He's being held at this point. There's other campus security and staff that have come to help and make sure that he is no longer a threat. Everyone gets transported who needs to be transported. So Paul Lee was still at that time fighting for his life. Tristan Cooper Roth, Sarah Williams, and then John Meese 
were all transported to Harborview Medical Center for treatment. You know, some were more severe than others. Yeah. Unfortunately, Paul Lee was pronounced dead at arrival at Harborview. Mm-hmm. Sarah Williams was in critical condition, but after surgery, you know, stayed stable and did make a full recovery. The person who was hit with the buckshot or pellet shot, it wasn't even, this is what kills me is it wasn't even buckshot. It was bird shot. It was like for clay shooting. Mm-hmm. That's the ammo that he brought. Yeah. So there were, you know, like I said, there was the one male who was hit when Paul was shot mm-hmm. with some of the pellets. So he was treated at Harborview and was kept overnight for observation, but made a full recovery as well. Meese had some abrasions after tackling Aaron to the ground. So he, you know, minor, but still fine. The police get him in in custody and they, they quickly take him back and they start interviewing him. It's a definitely a, it's, it's about an hour and a half long, Mm -hmm. about an hour, 15 minutes, I would say of an interview. And depending upon what, what version you watch, there's a couple all probably linked to the one where somebody's actually gone through and edited out like all of the things have been redacted, like his home address and things like that. Mm-hmm. But they've also edited out like the quiet times where there's nobody in the room with him and he's just yeah. sitting. So it's a little bit easier to watch if anybody wants to watch it. It's interesting. So he, what I didn't mention, and I don't know how it got left out because I remember typing it, but John Meese was able to pepper spray him before oh, he tackled yeah. him. So he's been pepper sprayed and it, he was easier to subdue because of it. So in the interview, he's still, you know, full on has been pepper sprayed yeah. and is just going through all the, the, you know, the snots running everywhere. His, he can't open his eyes. He's mm-hmm. coughing. He, he's just, having that reaction that lasts for a good amount of time I mean, hours police, you know, start interviewing him. They're questioning him. He's very cooperative. He, he's kind of resigned to the fact that he's been caught and he, he doesn't, he doesn't hold back on answering any questions. And they ask if he knew that, you know, planning something like this would probably bring him in contact with the police. And he said, Again, he mentioned that he had to pay a price Mm -hmm. so that he could die. So there was a cost so that he could die and end his suffering. He had to pay a price. He never intended to be caught, which is why I think that the statements that he would make of saying, I don't intend to hurt somebody. I, I don't know why you would say that to somebody when you don't, you intend to go down in a blaze of glory. Mm -hmm. Your intent is to hurt well, yeah, if he you're said there, there was to a kill price, people. he already knew what the price was. Right. Because he had thought about it. Right. But he says the knife that he brought was supposed to be used to slit his throat if things went wrong. Which, uh, being pepper sprayed and, and fighting off somebody, mm-hmm. he just, he wasn't able to do that. And it was wrestled away with him, you know, from him quite easily because he was so disoriented. There is a copy of the diary that he kept. He... He filled it with kind of his statement on why, what led up to him to yeah. doing this, his plans and, you know, some of the details that he, about what he wanted to do, but it was only a handful of entries that started in May of that year. So this happened in June, June 5th, and his entries were in, in like mid-May. So not even really a month, and there's mm-hmm. only a handful of entries. So for somebody who for about three years at this point has been, you know, really putting on a pedestal, these people who have committed mass murder shootings to only have a record of your thoughts for maybe about four or five days worth of like journal entries. It, it seems odd to me. If he had been researching Columbine or the Virginia Tech shootings, like he he claims in his own statements, mm-hmm. I I would think that he would have put a lot more documenting together to to really have like a manifesto, like a you know he he intends to die. He oh. says this. He intends to take a lot of people with him, 
And his, you know, heroes that he's worshiping are mass murderers. Did they have manifestos? I'm, I mean, I think that they did. Like Virginia Tech, he had, he had like made a video, didn't he? Of of kind of like you guys made me do this and this is all your fault. I vaguely remember that because I I remember thinking you're a fucking nut job and yeah. you know nobody asked to come and have you shoot them like that. It's not anybody's fault. Yeah. <laughs> like you, it, it, yeah, obviously mental health plays a a key role in that too. I cannot remember if the Columbine shooters had like documents or manifestos or anything like that yeah but you know when people want recognition and they want to leave they want to have a legacy behind because if you're dead you're not telling your story no. you kind of do that in a way where there's i don't know i i just feel like there's a lot of of these types of people who who have that need to be heard and understood mm -hmm. they ramble on and on and on a few pages and entries just seems odd to me yeah. So I don't I don't know if it, it maybe it makes complete sense. Maybe it's just me harping on one detail that it really isn't important. He does freely state that, you know, to the police that his diary is in the trunk of his or, you know, in the back of his truck. Mm -hmm. And they're more than welcome to read it. He's more than happy to share his thoughts with them. And he mentions it. He specifically mentions it. The detective that interviews him has not even has no knowledge of what's in the car. He's just getting base facts from him. Oh. And and Aaron, you know, oh, I have, by the way, I have a diary. I'm, I'm sure you're going to read it yeah. if you haven't already. And the the detective who's talking to him and, and you know, trying to just get him settled and get the, the ball rolling on things. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, Ari, you know, I, I, where are we going to find that? That's in your car. And, and he's like, yeah, it's in, in my truck. And, you, you know, feel free to read it and get whatever you need from it. It, it, it's it's that kind of stuff where it's just so contradictory, you know. Maybe he's bipolar, or maybe he. Well, I mean, has, the psychosis I think yeah. plays key, but it is that f that need of he keeps mentioning I I was disrespected. Yeah. Nobody nobody pays attention to me, you know. I, I'm I'm misunderstood, and there's a need to be understood. There's a need for somebody to to see you. Yeah. And and have, you know, your your thoughts and ideas live on beyond you. Total middle child. I mean, kind of. <laughs> he, like I said, co cooperates completely with the detectives and the officials who interrogate him. There, There's multiple ways to watch this on YouTube. There's multiple people who have uploaded this video. And like I said, there's one that I'll link that I watch specifically because it cuts out all of the... The boring, the boring stuff. stuff where he's just sitting there sniffling, yeah. you know, whining about being pepper sprayed, basically. So there are several charges that are brought against him, of course, and they waste no time in arraigning him. He is arraigned the next day. He is charged the next day. Hmm. Yeah. Some of the court documents that I read were interesting as well because his representation tried to have him plead insanity. Well, I mean, they did plead uh, not guilty by way of insanity. Mm -hmm. However, you can see in his interview that he is completely with it. He is not in a fantasy world. He has details. Mm -hmm. He's accurately relaying those details. It's it, it, there's no way that you can say in a moment of insanity, I went crazy. This yeah. is premeditated. It's preplanned. And he carried it out and documented, you know, even if it's shortly, he documented that. Yeah. Yeah. He is charged, of course, with one count of first degree murder, two counts of attempted murder in the first degree and one count of assault in second degree. And the assault okay. is against the bystander who got, you know, the pellets hit him. That wasn't mm. his intended target. Yeah. And again, he pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Really, I think what it boils down to is if you watch the, the interview, my issue with him pleading not guilty by way of insanity is mm. at one point the officer says, thank you so much for your cooperation. And Aaron says, yeah, you know, I, I know I'm caught. 
essentially. He he knows he's caught. He's been had. There's no getting out of it. And he's going to be as cooperative as possible. And he will tell them anything that they want to know. Okay. And he even does this with the patrolmen who take him into custody and transport him to the to the jail where he's interviewed. He starts then and there telling them why he did this and what he did. Just start singing. Yeah. Mm. And they're not asking. Yeah. I mean, they're they've just witnessed a scene and they're having to transport a suspect who has done a, a horrible thing. They're not asking you what you're done because they know that you're going to get into an interview room with a detective and they're yeah. going to interview you on camera, on tape and take, you know, these facts down. They're not asking for this, but he volunteers this very, very easily. So the trial begins in September of 2016. It does occur over quite a, a period of time. John Meese does take the stand and testifies. Aaron Ibarra testifies for himself as well. And um, would you expect nothing less? No. I mean I I didn't expect anything less. Because again, it's I think there is that sense of recognition and finally people are going to take me seriously, as he keeps saying. In the end, Ibarra was sentenced to 112 years in prison. Hmm. No possibility of parole. And he was age 29 when he was sentenced. Yeah, that's a death sentence. Yeah. When asked if he had a statement to make, he named each of the victims. And he said, quote, I've realized I've damaged more than just innocent people. I've damaged the community and even the world. I've hurt a lot of people's emotions. I wish I could take that away, but I can't. I'm sorry to the world. Hmm. And... You know, at this point, if he's been, you know, the, this was three years after the incident, he's probably been put back on medication. Yeah. There's maybe. probably some treatment happening for him. Yeah. I can see where there's, you know, he he might be at this point now reconciling what he did in that mental state mm -hmm. compared to where he's at now. But I, I it, it still is very hard to have any sympathy for him if he is truly sorry yeah. you know well, hearing all that too i don't know yeah yeah the victim who who was deceased paulie he was only 19 years old mm. he had graduated the year prior from high school and we were talking about it but the that cliche he was a ray of light yeah. um that was how he was described by one of his teachers and it was also said it was impossible to be around him and not feel happy. Yeah. He made class fun for everyone. His laugh and smile were both contagious. Everyone who knew him felt close to him. And this teacher goes on to say, he will always be remembered for his infectious positive attitude. I know I will never forget him. So they did hold a memorial for him. It was very hard for the students and his family members to, you know, to deal with that, to, mm -hmm. to deal with the loss and the grief. There's just no, there's no good reason no. for anything like this to happen. You know, it's, it's, it's tragic, especially somebody who's 19 years old, their whole life is ahead of them. Mm -hmm. It It's horrible. You know, it's, it's a horrible thing. And there's just, there's nothing that makes it right. E even, even him being convicted and charged and, and being in prison, yeah. it, it does not change what happened. It doesn't, doesn't make it better. There is a, a, a I guess, a, a happy end to this that I can give it. Mm -hmm. So John Meese was hailed as a hero after this. Yeah. I mean, he, he had no way of knowing that he was going to be able to subdue this guy. He had pepper spray compared to a shotgun and a knife. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, your odds are not in your favor necessarily, no. but he, he did. He really, you know, took a chance and did what he needed to do. So he is actually at the end of this given a medal. So he. By the city? Sorry, I'm, no, actually he's given. He was honored with a congressional medal of honor. This happened before the sentencing. So he was honored March 25th in 2015. So just a year after the shooting, almost a year after the shootings. And it states that, quote, he was selected for a singular act of heroism 
during a violent and deadly shooting spree at Seattle Pacific University on June 5th, 2014. While serving as a student building monitor and teacher assistant, John Meese risked his life when he pepper sprayed and stopped the shooter after he was reloading his shotgun. So if Meese had not acted to protect others, the casualties could have been much worse. Oh, yeah. In recognition of his selfless act, Seattle Pacific University has established a scholarship in Mises' name. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say maybe happy ending is, is wrong, but recognition. Good yeah. recognition for, for a very, I mean, definitely selfless heroic, act. selfless yeah. act. Yeah. And he was also recognized at the same time as a Vietnam vet was selected and recognized for the same he was nominated by the nonprofit Fallen Heroes Project. So that's that's kind of, I mean, to honor, uh, to be honored with a Vietnam vet yeah. is is kind of a big deal. So it's it's really, I think, well-deserved, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that is the story of a local school shooting. I mean, they're, they're not, they don't seem to be going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Very, it's just, it's, it's very unfortunate that it's something that affects young people. I mean, you know, anybody could be on a college campus, right? Teachers can be older. Students can be older. But some, you know, these things are happening in high schools and elementary schools that you know who that affects. It doesn't affect the, the older community. The older community is left to, to mourn. No. It affects these children who are just trying to get an education. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's unfortunate that it's, a thing to have to deal with now. Yeah. But yeah, that's what I got. Thank you, John Meese. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely, uh, you know, everybody that, that survived that, the family members of Paul Lee, it's, yeah. it's very, I'm, you know, the lifelong issues that, that these people are going to have now is uh, we definitely, you know, you have our thoughts and, and it sounds cliche, but you have our thoughts and prayers because it's, it's that's very hard to navigate your life when it's been so drastically changed in this way. You yeah. know, any any family members of victims, that's definitely difficult. Oh, and survivors, you know, survivors' guilt. It's it's hard, but yeah, that's all I got. So don't forget September first, hundredth episode. We're doing a live. What the fuck? It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be legendary. As mm-hmm. Olivia would say. So everybody will be there. Everybody will be there. Yep. Mara. Yep. The whole game. Cass, Mara, Olivia, Bryce and I, and the podcast puppies. Yay. So don't forget. And we'll so you know, we'll send out some reminders for things too. So all right, guys. As always, we want to thank you for listening and supporting us. And we appreciate all the time that you've given us over the last few years. And we're so excited to be at 100 episodes. Hey. hey. So always remember, stay safe and stay out of the damn woods. Stay out of the woods. Bye, guys. <laughs>